Greetings, everyone, and thank you for joining me on this podcast. You are now listening to Solar Coaster, A Diary of Me by R. Kelly with R. Kelly Appeal TV. The time is 2.02, and it is February 22nd, 2022. It's amazing. That portal has been opened all day. So we're going to go right into the reading, and this is the third video of the Solar Coaster book that we're reading. And we're trying to find out ways that we can kind of understand R. Kelly's uh, point of view um, when it came to the things that he has been convicted or said that he has done. Um, We can kind of get a feel of how he grew up, the backstory behind the superstar. So let's get started. Women in the house. Growing up in the hood, the number one rule was don't snitch, don't tell. Like learning two plus two equals four. It was drilled into you. And if you didn't know two plus two equals four, you failed in the hood. If you snitched, you weren't going to make it. There were always women in our little house at 40th and King. There were cousins, aunties, friends of my aunties, all older women. When my mother wasn't home, the women ran a little freer, meaning that when my mom or my grandmother weren't home, they dressed a certain way. When my mother and grandmother were out, they felt free to wear less clothing. You could see through their blouses. Sometimes they wore bras, sometimes they didn't. When they walked around in nightgowns or pajamas, you could see their panties. And on a few occasions, like on very hot summer days, they wouldn't even wear them. As a very young boy, I didn't think much of it. The women didn't really pay much attention to me or my brothers. I looked at them the way any kid would. Kids are naturally fascinated by body parts and I was no different. As I crept up in age though and made my way through grammar school, I found myself more curious and sometimes aroused. And I was ashamed of being aroused, but there was no one I felt could talk to about this. I couldn't have a sit down with my mother because I wouldn't know what to say or how to say it. There was no man that I trusted enough to share such shameful feelings with. Growing up with that shame was has haunted me throughout my life. One winter afternoon, I came back from school early when my mother wasn't home. As I came through the door, I heard a strange noise. I heard bed springs squeaking. The walls were very paper thin and sound came through it like there weren't any wall- walls at all. The squeaking got louder. Then I heard voices, a woman scream, but it didn't sound like a scream of pain or panic. Then I heard a man's voice shouting, but it wasn't in anger. And they went on with their sexual situation. He was eight years old. He didn't understand what was happening. He thought that the man was maybe trying to hurt the woman, but that didn't seem right to R. Kelly. I was confused, curious, so I went to see for myself. I crept down the bedroom where the noises were coming from. They were doing so much hollering. I figured they wouldn't hear the door if I opened it just a little. I opened it up and I looked inside. Just then the woman caught sight of him. They stopped abruptly. Little Robert, what are you doing in here, boy? I got scared and started running. She shouted out. Come on back. It's okay. They were still in bed, both of them naked, when she said, you can watch, but you better not say shit to nobody about this. I knew the women in my house weren't dressing or acting right. My mother or grandmother wouldn't dream of parading around the house half-dressed. At the same time, I couldn't snitch. In my house and growing up in the hood, the number one rule was don't snitch, don't tell. It was the same as learning two plus two equals four. It was drilled into you, and if you didn't know two plus two equals four, you failed. In the hood... If you snitched, you weren't going to make it. Still, as I grew older, things began to change when I was around these women. When I was nine, they changed in a major way. I began to regret this code of silence. If my mother had known what was going on in the house, she probably would have burnt it down. She didn't play that. I wanted to tell her, but I had a hard time trying to figure out who would really be in trouble, me or them. At that age, I didn't really know how to handle it. I knew it wasn't right, but I just didn't know how to say anything about it. Talking about it was strange, so I locked it away as my own little secret. At the time, mom was going out with Lucius, the man she later married when I was still a kid. I wasn't happy about it because I wanted her to stay home with me, but Lucius was okay. He was a nice man, nice to me, and most times nice to my mother. He liked to tell stories about his army days since my real daddy was long gone. 
I like listening to an older man talking about back in the day. I saw Lucius more like a big brother than a father. My mother and Lucius went out together often. Sometimes they left me with Uncle Doug. My brothers didn't like Lucius, but my attitude was different from theirs. Anything that made mom happy made me happy too. One Saturday evening, we were watching TV. Don't watch that television set all night, mom said before she and Lucius left the house. Me and my brothers liked horror movies. We were watching the creator from the Black Lagoon when the TV crapped out. Picture went dead. I called up to Uncle Carrie to fix it, but he was snoring loud enough to wake the dead. My brothers went off to bed, but I kept banging on the TV, hoping to get the picture back. When it did pop back on, the monster was rising out of the Black Lagoon. I was waiting to see what would happen next, when just like that, the damn picture crapped out again. Disgusted, I fell asleep on the couch. I was far away in some dream when I heard that same noise, bed spring squeaking. The guy yelling, tell me how much you like it. The lady screaming back. I got up and looked around the house to make sure my mother wasn't home. She was still out with Lucius. This time I knew what all this noise was about, and truth be told, I wanted to have another good look. I opened the door just enough to see them kicking it hard. I mean, they were deep into it. I stood there for a while, and just as I started to close the door, the woman spotted me. Don't move, Rob, she said. I was scared, didn't know what to expect. Come over here and get this camera. She said, take a picture of us. I was dumbfounded, couldn't say a word. You do know how to use this thing, don't you? I was too stunned to talk. All I could do was shake my head. No, it's easy. She said, just aim this camera and snap a picture. She gave me a Polaroid camera. The guy liked the idea as much as she did. They got into positions where I could see their private parts. I snapped the picture. When she showed me how it took only a minute to develop, I was amazed. The photographic technology impressed me more than the sex. She grabbed the photo and kept it for herself. I took the memory of them doing the dirty and stashed it inside my mind's brick box. A couple of Saturday nights later, mom was out again and I was sitting on the couch with Uncle Doug. We were watching TV. My favorite show was the Jeffersons. But on this particular night, we were looking at Three's Company. Uncle Doug turned to me and asked, now this here is every man's dream. Every man dream of, ha of living with two women. Which one do you like? I like the blonde, I said, Chrissy. I like both of them, Uncle Doug said. I ain't about to kick either one of them out of my bed. Halfway through the show, the TV went dead again. Carrie, Uncle Doug shouted, where's that um, repair man when we need him? Going out with Grandma, I said. Uncle Doug let out a big sigh. Oh, well, probably better off. If he start fooling with the TV, the thing might blow up and burn the house down. Boy, I've had enough for one day. I'm going to bed. Good night, Uncle Doug. Good night, Rob. I stayed on the couch staring at the dark TV, thinking what it might be like to have a dad like George Jefferson, someone with enough money to move us all into a fancy high rise in the sky. I started thinking about Jack Tripper, the guy in Three's Company and the cool but confusing situation he was in. I drifted off to sleep and fell into a cozy dream about Three's Company when a strange feeling in my body woke me up. The feeling was down below my belt. I opened my eyes and saw that a female was playing with me. She was at least 10 years older than me. I was eight. What are you doing? I asked. You'll like it, she said. It'll feel good. Look what happens when I rub it. She kept rubbing until I got hard. I didn't say anything. Then she put it in her mouth and started sucking. At first, I was scared. She was going to do something crazy like bite me. I tried to push her away, but she wouldn't stop until she was finished. When she was, she said, you better not say shit to no one or else you're going to get a terrible whooping, she threatened. I knew she meant business. I knew to keep quiet every time she did it. And she did it repeatedly for years. She warned me about what would happen to me if I snitched. No matter how many times it happened, I knew I could never tell anyone. I was too afraid and too ashamed. All I could do was stash the secret and hide it in my imaginary brick box. <sighs> Sunday morning. My belief in God has been with me since I was a little boy and I still believe in God now. I believe in the I believe in the grace and mercy of Jesus. That belief got seated in me when I was just a kid. No matter how many other crazy things jumped off in my life, God was always there. My mother made sure of that. On Sundays, I would put on my freshly ironed best black trousers, clean white shirt, little clip on bow tie, and follow mom to the little storefront church where we went to sing and pray. 
I had to get myself ready for a long day. Church went on for three, sometimes four hours. The church did not hold more than 25 people. It was no bigger than a liquor store or pizza joint. Our pastor was Mother Nance. She had these big frightening eyes, but was a sweet lady who was all about the Lord. She preached her sermons like songs, singing the lessons she hoped to impart to us. A small band backed Mother Nancy. The beast came from a drummer banging on nothing but a snare. He worked it hard and the groove he laid down made me happy. The broken down organ had a bunch of missing keys. From where I sat, I could see the woman at the old instrument. And don't ask me how, when she hit a key, that didn't work, it could feel in the missing note in my mind. It was a game I liked to play. I could hear the whole composition. Everyone else in the room had the music in 2D. I heard it in 3D. When my mother got up, faced the congregation and started in on Amazing Grace, she became a star. She sang so hard until everyone was standing and waving, shouting God's name. They loved my mother singing. When the saints heard I could sing, they wanted me to do a solo, but I was too shy. Besides, I figured mom sang good enough for the two of us. Later in the services, when I got a little bored with the songs, I changed the words around. When everyone was singing, Jesus is on the main line, tell him what you want. I sang, that girl in the choir is so fine, gonna tell her what I want. And my lyrics went right along with the song. Once Aunt Rose, sitting right behind me, heard me and slapped me beside the head. Boy, she said, you better sing the right lyrics or I'm telling your mama. Service went on so long, I usually couldn't help but nod off. One time, I don't know how long I had been sno snoozing when a scream woke me up. It was my mother. Joanne Kelly had caught the Holy Ghost and was shaking and shivering like she had some terrible fever. She was yelling out, ain't gonna smoke no more, Jesus God. Ain't gonna have another cigarette long as I live. Tears were streaming down her face. She was crying and talking in tongues, reaching into her purse, grabbing her pack of cigarettes and throwing them into the aisle. No more, she was yelling. Ain't gonna touch another one of these cancer sticks for the rest of my life. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. After church, we went home for a big Sunday dinner, which was all so delicious. We were all filled up and satisfied. <clears throat> My mother was drinking her coffee when she leaned over and whispered to me, run over to Mr. Eichenberg's and get me a pack of Winston's. But mom, I started to say, you heard me, boy, now go. When I got back, my mother was waiting for me at the door. She took her Winston's, went to the bathroom, locked the door behind her, and lit up. When she was through, she sprayed the smell away with the can of aerosol. She didn't want anyone to know. But I knew. I knew more than I should have about the things that happened in our house. I was there the Sunday that Grandma came back from church and announced that she got saved. That means you, you ain't drinking no more of that old granny dad whiskey, Mom asked. Not a drop, said Grandma. And what about your Paul Malls? Mom wanted to know. Quit smoking, quit cursing, just living for the Lord. I was surprised. Grandma and Uncle Carrie loved their old granddad. And when they fought, they loved cussing up a storm. What about Carrie? He got saved along with you, asked Mom. Yes, he did, said Grandma. Carrie was standing next to her. The man was all smiles. Well, well, my mother muttered. Um, the Lord works in mysterious ways. Yes, he do, said my grandmother. He sure enough do. From that point on, Grandma's moods were more talking down to you than screaming at Uncle Carrie. In fact, we referred to Grandma and Uncle Carrie, who lived on the upper floor as the uppities. After Grandma got saved and indulged her uppity attitude, she and my mother would get into heavy arguments. For example, Grandma didn't like my mother playing bingo. You going to ask God, Grandma told her, why you say that? I don't. The Bible does. Where in the Bible does it say you do not need to play bingo? Back then, they didn't have no bingo. Proverbs 13 and 11. Dishonest money dwindles away, but he who gathers money little by little makes it grow. That's what I'm doing, my mother said. I'm making my little money grow. Besides, nothing dishonest about bingo. Yes, uh, you play the numbers, said Grandma. Everyone plays the numbers. Look here, Grandma explained, opening her Bible, Ecclesiastes 5 and 10. Whoever loves money never has money enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied. I don't say I love money. I just say I need money. We need money. You need money. We need God. We got God, her daughter said. But to keep from getting kicked out of this her, her house, we got to pay rent. 
and you telling me that if I hit the number and collect a few thousand, you wouldn't be following me to a nicer house. I'm following Jesus to wherever he leads. Well, I believe Jesus is leading me to the numbers, man, because they this week I got a good hunch. If my number do come in, I won't bother telling you. I don't want my Bible believing mother covered in my sin. With that, my mother walked out of the room. Grandma gave me a look as if to say, boy, you bet not smile. And I didn't. Enjoying the ride? I wanted to do my homework and get all A's. I wanted to prove myself and make my mother proud. But every time I made up my mind to conquer the problem and start reading, every time I opened a book, my mind would turn off. So we're gonna move into school days. When I was at church, I learned to sing the words from memory, but at school, when it came time to open a book and read silently or out loud, I couldn't focus on the words. I didn't even see the words. Every time my teacher called on me to read, my heart sank. I choked up, I stammered and stuttered. It was terrible because the other kids would start giggling. I felt like a cripple and an alien. Hear my schoolmates learning like nobody's business, building up their vocabularies, reading all their stories. I wanted to read so bad I couldn't take I, I could taste it. I wanted to do whatever what everyone else was doing. But the more I tried, the worse it became. Trying to learn how to read and spell in school for me was like throwing a brick on top of the Sears Tower. That's how hard it was for me. I really tried hard because if for no other reason, I didn't want the kids calling me a dummy. I look around at every other kid and they were reading and writing and spelling and doing math. They were going forth with their books and their studies. But when it came to me being able to study, I just couldn't do it. I couldn't make sense of the words on the page. I desperately wanted to learn how to read, so I made a hell of an effort. But the more I tried to study, my mouth would get dry. I'd get sleepy and start yawning the minute I even tried to read a book or study spelling words. I wanted to do my homework and get all A's. I wanted to prove myself and make my mother proud. But every time I made up in my mind to conquer the problem and start reading, every time I opened a book, my mind would turn off. Time and again, Time and again, a mess out of this whole reading business, and I'd wish that the ground would open and swallow me whole. I didn't know what to think about myself. Was I sick? Was I really a dummy? What was wrong with me? Those thoughts scared me to death, but I was too afraid to say anything to anybody. You got genius, my mother told me after a day at school where kids were laughing at me because I couldn't read. I wanted to believe my mother, but it was hard. To me as a kid, if you were a good reader, it meant you had a good brain. If you were a bad reader, it meant you had no brain. Bad reading meant you were obviously a dummy. It wasn't until I was an adult that an educator told me about dyslexia. She said dys dyslexia is where kids have trouble learning to read or interpret words. She also said it's got nothing to do with your intelligence. Steve Jobs, Walt Disney, and even Leonardo Da Vinci all has some form of dyslexia, but my disability is something more than dyslexia. They still don't know what caused my problem. I'll never know if it was possibly brain damage. As one specialist diagnosed or an accident of spirit, God's way of making sure that I fulfill my destiny. Another crazy thing about my reading program is that I've always loved words, still do. I love stories about faraway places and different kinds of people. I wanted to be able to read these stories like everyone else. I always looked, loved listening to how different people, my mother, my aunts, Uncle Doug, Lucius, told stories each in their own special way. I instinctively understood the power of language and the magic of storytelling from a very young age. Words had a spirit that got all over me. Depending on how they were used, words could scare me, confront me, um, comfort me, encourage me, make me happy or make me sad. It broke my heart that I found it so hard, in fact, downright impossible to read words on the page. Outside of school, I spent a good t amount of time with my brothers, Bruce and Carrie. My mother wanted all her kids to get along. Y'all are blood, she would remind us. Y'all need to be there for each other. Sometimes that was easy, especially if it was involving Kung Fu. Me and my brothers were deep into Bruce Lee. We get to the Met movie theater on King Drive down the street from where we lived and sit in the hypnotized 
by films like Enter the Dragon and First Fist of Fury. Bruce Lee was our man from his lightning fast nunchucks to his awesome sword work to the way he down, to the way he downed a dozen opponents without breaking a sweat. He had that cut up 12 pack body, that attitude, that look in his eyes that said, I don't know the meaning of fear. When we left the theater, we were out of our minds with Bruce Lee cockiness. We were working up and ready to roll against anyone who even looked at us funny. We'd come out of that movie kicking like we actually knew what we were doing. You better not try to challenge us after a Bruce Lee flick. Big bro Bruce and little bro killer, we call Carrie Killer, after a Flip Wilson character grandma loved. Came charging out of the Bruce Lee film high on the action we just seen. Man, we were flying on that Bruce Lee energy. We got home playing like we were actually in the movie. When I landed a roundabout kick on Killer that sent him through our living room window, he got a little cut up and felt some pain, but it was nothing like the pain we felt when mom, we'd feel when mom got home. We knew that if we didn't think of something quick, mom would give us the worst whooping of our lives. So we started thinking and plotting, trying to come up with a story that we're sure mom would buy, that we would, were sure mom would buy. We got it all planned out. We thought we were real smart. Mom came home and right off yelled, what the hell happened in here? Big bro Bruce led off. Me and Killer were in his backup. We was just sitting in the living room watching TV when someone, maybe they were gang members or something, came by hollering and screaming. And the next thing we knew, the, they threw this brick through the window. We ran to see who it was, but then they were gone. You see, Mom, the brick is still there, right here where it landed. Thank goodness it didn't hit any of us. We were lucky, Mom, really lucky. My mother stood there just staring at us. I mean, seriously staring. Gonna ask you boys again, she said, what happened? Me and Killer backed up Bruce's story. We said how scared we were when that brick came flying through. Mom kept staring. Her eyes were like laser beams going through her heads. Gonna ask you one more time, boys, and then I'm gonna get my biggest switch at, that I can find and start whipping your behinds until I hear the truth. The thought of a whipping had us start defending ourselves even harder. We kept saying we were minding our own business, how we were going, being good boys, how we didn't do anything wrong. And then here came this brick. Then came the bullet. <laughs> Mom just stood there shaking her head. We saw that she wasn't buying a word of it. But at the same time, to our little brains, our story seemed bulletproof. If what y'all say is true, she said, then why is all the broken glass on, um, out on the porch? Why ain't there no broken glass here on the inside? If someone throws a brick in the window, how does the glass shatter backwards? We hadn't thought of that. Of course, my mother was right. There wasn't a share a shard of glass in the living room. The only thing in the living room was that brick sitting on the floor. The cleanest brick you ever saw. It wasn't even sitting crooked. For days after that, we could barely sit at all. Mom whipped our asses good. All we got out of the whole thing was a bad memory from her switch of fury. Bruce Lee created the kick butt genre of the Kung Fu movies that paved the way for everyone who followed him from Chuck Norris, Steven Seagal, and Jean-Claude Van Damme to Jackie Chan. The death of our indestructible hero when Lee's brain swelled in his sleep and he died in 1973 was a painful pill that my, my brothers and I truly swallowed. There were times like these when my brothers and I stuck together. At other times, we could barely stand being in the same room, especially Carrie and me. I never got along too well with my little brother and we used to fight all the time. One night I watched, I wanted to watch Good Times and he didn't. He had another program that he won't, that he thought was better. Nothing was better than Good Times. I not only love the show, but I love the theme song and I love singing it to this day. The show opened with a shot of a high rise housing project. Although it was never mentioned in the opening credits, everyone in Chicago knew it was our very own Cabrini Green. Back then, the hard and good times, the Evans family, Florida, James, JJ, Thelma, Michael, the militant midget faced on every episode was absolute 
reality TV to me. But Carrie was watching an old Three Stooges movie and wouldn't let me change channels. He took a swing at me and I landed a blow to and landed a blow to my left eye. My eye got puffy and I got crazy angry. I grabbed a broom from the kitchen and started chasing him. I planned to hit him over the head with this broom and chased him into the bathroom. Our mother yelled for us to cut it out, but we kept fighting. If y'all don't stop, she screamed, I'm coming in there. I still wasn't stopping. I got carried back into the bathroom. When mom showed up, she happened to be carrying a knife she'd been using to slice some vegetables. I didn't know she was directly behind me. So when I stepped back, I stepped into her knife and got cut. Blood was gushing everywhere and I was hollering. Y'all trying to kill me. Mom wants to kill me. My mother dropped the knife and grabbed me crying. She said she was sorry. She immediately started to bandage me up. Turns out the cut wasn't all that deep, but that didn't keep me from hollering like a baby. My mother always wanted to show us how families should be able to lean on each other and stand by one another. I wanted to please and obey her. Take your brother Carrie to the park, Rob, she said one day. Let him play on the swings, but don't push him too high. When we got to the playground, Carrie was happy as could be. He loved those swings. He jumped on and asked me to push him. I gave him a shove. Higher, he screamed. I pushed him higher. Higher, he screamed even louder, so I pushed him even higher. Little bro was having the time of his life. Higher, he kept demanding. Now, I knew not to push any higher because he was already flying super high, but he was insisting, so I kept pushing while he kept sailing higher until the swing got loose. I saw him get caught on the chain. He came flying off and hit the grass. Carrie was a mess, blood all over. He was crying. I was scared. He was crying. I was scared, but somehow I got him home. Mom rushed him to the emergency. All I could think of was, God, what have I done to my little brother? So I'm going to stop here and uh, we're going to talk about secrets in the next episode. And this will be on February 23rd. Um, so we will see you then. But think about all of the things that we just read. They were very vital to, you know, how he saw life eventually with women, how he saw life with relationships. How how do you think he felt as a young adult seeing sexuality right in his face like a movie and then having to take pictures of it? So this was part of his his history that he was taught. So um, <clears throat> and if we don't receive help then those things will linger in our dark box and eventually it will show up. So, um, yeah, what do you think about this podcast here? Um, the information that was shared. I thank you so much for listening, liking, joining, and subscribing, and we'll see you tomorrow.